Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. Today I'm speaking with Ricky Dye, a paroled juvenile offender. At the age of 15 years old, Ricky was charged with first-degree premeditated murder and armed robbery. He ultimately pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 34 years in prison with 12 years suspended. His co-defendants, Kenneth DeWitt and David Hollifield, received significant sentences as well. DeWitt received 50 years with 12 years suspended for second-degree murder, while Hollifield was sentenced to five years for robbery by force and fear. Ricky Dye was released from prison on September 1st, 2009. Here's my interview with Ricky Dye. Uh, my name is Ricky Dye, and I'm from McLeod, Oklahoma, a little town about 45 minutes outside Oklahoma City. So let's let's talk a little bit about your childhood. Can you recall any positive memories that stick out to you from your childhood? Oh, yeah, I, I had a good childhood, to be honest with you, man. Uh, I, I would like to say that what happened to me in my life was because I was just uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or it happened because my dad left when I was a kid, which my dad did. He left when he was eight. And uh, uh, when you look around in the world, something I've found is if you if you look and see a man that's doing pretty well, he probably had a father in his life. If you see a guy that's really struggling or been in and out of prison or he's into drugs and he can't keep a job, probably didn't have a good father figure. So the most important thing a man can do is to be a good dad, in my opinion. Uh, but I didn't have a good dad. Uh, he left when I was eight and uh, my mother didn't do it because she realized what it was doing to me. But my dad would send shitty messages back and forth between me. And I ended up with ulcers at around nine from that. Uh, but my mother, my grandmother, they took me to church. Um, I was pretty much a straight A student in school. Um, I was first string in all the sports. I, I did get a few B's. Uh, never really got in trouble when I was a kid. I went to church every Wednesday and Sunday with my grandmother and um, church camp every year. And that's the only time I had been away from home. Um, I did spend the night with one of my friends here and there in school, but I would never let them spend the night with me because my mother had. Me, then I have two little brothers and a little sister, and she married a guy that worked in a feed mill at the time of when I got locked up, and, and he had two kids even younger than us. So they're living on barely enough money to pay the rent with six kids. And uh, we were real poor, and I was ashamed of that. I, I would walk to school because I didn't want my friends to see what I was driving in. And, th and that's where a lot of my... I was an all-American kid. No one could have seen it coming. The church kid, the first string student, you know, a, a student. But in, in my mind, I, when you have a woman, okay, my stepdad didn't have a hand over me the way a dad could. My mom was in control of her kids, and he was in control of his. That, that's the deal they had. And in, in other videos, like I've done one with Chad Marks, I said that I had a good upbringing, but I was having problems with my mom. But what I mean by that is when a, when a woman is trying to raise three young men by herself, a, a boy gets to the age where he decides not to listen to a woman. And that's kind of where I was. I got tired of her telling me what to do. I felt like I was, I was 15. I was almost grown in my mind. And uh, worrying about what my friends thought at school was a big deal to me. And that, that's one thing I've learned in my life, too, is that a 15-year-old's kid problems to him are just as serious as a man's are on death row to him. Uh, so I don't take anyone's problems lightly because they are serious to every one of us. Right. Most uh, definitely. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I know you said that uh, your dad left when he was eight or when you were eight, but um, besides that, can you recall any other negative memories that stick out to you from your childhood? No, I, I had a good childhood, man. I, I can't say that I was abused or anything in any way. My family was poor, but other than that, it was that's it. We were poor, but we were loved. And uh, I was taught the right way. I shouldn't have been where I was that night. That never should have happened. So what was your behavior like at home growing up? I didn't get in trouble. Like I said, I went to church every Wednesday and Sunday. I I didn't get in a lot of trouble. I did get in some fights at school, you know, over my little brothers or or a dare from other kids, you know. Uh, so that so that's what ended up leading to what happened with me is we were I was in I was in just got ninth grade. I have pretty popular in school because I started at all the sports. Uh, and this kid named Kenneth comes to school with us. 
And he's about six months younger than me, but he's in our grade. And Kenneth had been in Taekwondo. And Kenneth also, when he was younger, had been so skinny that the doctors had put him on steroids. And because of that, even though he was only 14, he's bigger than all of us. His muscles were round. He had hair on his arms. He could almost grow a beard when he's 14 years old. And uh, so, so kids at school started, you know, I wonder who's tougher, Ricky or Kenneth. And that's where it all started. They would dare me to do something, and I wouldn't back out of it because I wasn't going to look weak. And then Kenneth would do the same thing. And uh, I started I started having a problem with my mom putting rules on me. If I want to go spend night with my friend, I didn't think she should tell me no. She had every right to tell me no, but I didn't feel like she should. As long as I felt like it was safe, she shouldn't say nothing. That's pretty much the attitude I took. And uh, so somewhere along the line, Kenneth, Kenneth told me that his dad lived in California. And he woke up every day with a heroin needle in his arm and he sold drugs and he had a bunch of money. And he tells me, if we can just get down there, he's going to give us both a fake ID. Saying we're 16. He's going to give us both a thousand dollars and a car. And we're going to come back home and everything's going to be great, man. We're going to be the first kids in school with a car. We're going to have an ID show them we're 16. My family's poor. I'm going to have $1,000 to help my mom. To, to, to me at 15, what proves I wasn't thinking as an adult, as a man, because in my mind, that was going to fix everything, $1,000. was going to make us rich to my 15-year-old mind. Uh, so I had definitely watched too much TV. And even though I thought I was grown, I was not grown by any, by any means. So did you engage in any criminal activity uh, prior to the homicide case that you caught? No, none at all. Never stole a piece of gum. So let's talk about that case that you served 24 years in prison for. You, alongside two other teenagers, I did. were convicted I did. of killing 41-year-old store clerk um, Larry Hilderbrand, Hilderbrand. I'm sorry. Can you walk mm -hmm. me through everything that led up to this crime and what the aftermath was? So just to clarify... I ended up pleading guilty to second degree murder with a 30 for a 34 year sentence with 12 being suspended. I did. So that that made me do 22 years in prison. Once I finished that 22, then I had 12 on the streets for a total of 34 on that 22 year sentence. I did 20 years, five months and 29 days and discharged it. I did never make parole or get. Anything I had to discharge the Senate. Um, so what happened, like I said, uh, the night that all of this happened, all week leading up to it, me and Kenneth had been being dared that we were going to rob a store and run away to California. We've been dared by other kids to do this. We both say we're going to do it. I had just broken up with my girlfriend. And when you're 15 years old, breaking up with your girlfriend is a big deal, man. So I thought, my mom doesn't love me like she used to. Of course she did. But because she would tell me no on things, I thought she didn't love me anymore. So uh, that, that show, I, I think I had mental issues way back then, but it just wasn't recognized or diagnosed. But the night that it come, when it, when it all came down, that earlier that night, I, I asked my mom to spend a night with another friend. Me and my girlfriend had kind of made up. I was backing out of it. I wasn't going to do it. And me and my mom got into an argument and she slapped me. Uh, I told her she couldn't pick my friends and telling her, she said, I couldn't spend night with this guy. And I say, yes, I can. You know, and she should have slapped me a couple more times is what she should have did. But she only did it once and felt bad when I started crying. So I had guns. Uh, I had my dad's 410 uh, that my dad had owned when he was a kid have been passed down to me as a Christmas gift uh, for squirrel hunting whenever I had adults with me to show me and teach me to do it. My family is raised real country. They hunt and fish all the time. So I was raised squirrel hunting and rabbit hunting. That's something that people do in Oklahoma growing up. And so uh, I had that. I had a deer rifle, a 30-30 lever action deer rifle. I also had a 20-gauge Mossberg pump. 
So I went into my bedroom and what I was going to do is walk in the living room with my 3030 and ask my mom, do you love me now? And I was going to shoot myself in the face. That's what I was going to do. I was going to kill myself. But instead, I decided to go ahead and run away from home. So I asked my mom to get let me go to the pool hall. It's about two blocks from our house. And she let me go. She feels bad because we've got into it. And she wished she wouldn't have slapped me. And she shouldn't have slapped me in the face. But but I, I, there I was 15. She's just a little woman trying to raise a bunch of boys. And I forced her hand. Uh, she had to show me that I she wasn't afraid of me because of the way I was carrying myself. So I end up calling Kenneth, the 14-year-old. Hey, man, I changed my mind. I'll go. Let's go. Let's go. So I get these girls at the pool hall that are 16 from a little town over here called Hera. They live close by. And they ran me out there to get him. So, so when we got out there and got him, when I went to pick Kenneth up, he had a cousin that was a year older than us. She was in 10th grade. We were in ninth. And whenever I picked him up, he he grabbed a ball bat and a duffel bag to bring with him. Well, his cousin seen all this, and she called his mom and his stepdad and told on us. Hey, they're running away from home. Kenneth's got a ball bat. So they get scared and don't know what to do. So they call the police station on us. Hey, Kenneth and Ricky are running away from home. They got a ball bat. They're going to rob a store for money to get away from California. So we've made it back to town and we're trying to get away to run away. We don't have a car. So we're outside the little pool hall and we, we messed up two or three people's car we're, with screwdrivers and pocket knives trying to steal their car. He said he knew how to do it, but he couldn't do it. I didn't know how to do it. And then we're just tearing people's car up. And we're afraid we're going to get caught. So there was a party going on outside of town here. <laughs> so something else that happens in Oklahoma is people will throw little parties at their house out in the country. They'll get a keg or two. Everybody will bring some beer and some alcohol. And especially uh, back when I was growing up, it may be a, someone's parents was gone and they were 16 or 17 and welcomed everyone there and everyone brings this liquor. So you've got people showing up anywhere from 15 years old to around 25. Guys who've just got out of school and stuff that live around there. And this is where a friend of mine is at named David Hollifield, which is one of the defendants. So we get a ride out there and we go in there and we're sitting in the bathroom at this party and this party has run out of liquor. So we're in the bathroom and we're trying to get David to take us. We got, we have, we snuck the guns out of my house. The original thing we snuck the guns out of the house was he knew somewhere to sell them, but then he couldn't get them to answer the phone. So we decide we're going to go back. We're going to rob a store and we're going to use the money to run away with. That's the plan. Not to kill anyone. That, that, that's not the plan at all. No one is even thinking about trying to kill anybody. We're just trying to get some money to run away. So we said we're going to rob a store. So we get to this, this party and we're in the bathroom and we're telling these older people our plans. 16, 17, 18, some of them up to 25 years old. And instead of talking us out of it, which, which I'm not blaming it on anyone else, it is completely on me. I take full responsibility. I should have been at home. I should have listened to my mama. I shouldn't have never been there. It's my fault, totally. But these adults, young adults, rather than tell us not to do this, they started explaining us how to get away with it. And uh, they wanted us to take the beer and bring it back to the party for them. So they're telling us how to get the beer and how to rob and how to get the stuff out of the cash register. They're, they really helped us plan it out. And, uh, so then we get this oldest boy, David, he, he decides he's going to take us to the store to get the beer and the money, but he won't take us out of state. So that's what we decide. We're going to go over here, wahoo this beer, take this money, use it for money to get away. But when you go into something like that, bro, you never know what can happen when you have a weapon. Uh, when, when anything can happen, and that's exactly what happens. Uh we got to the store, and the first time we got there, his we, my family knows this man's family. My uncles have partied with him and his brother, and my mom has went out with his sons, and we all know each other. But I didn't know that because I was a kid. But Kenneth, his family also knows him. 
So when we when we come back out of the store, I think I bought a candy bar. I bought a candy bar and a pop. And we got some gas. And we come back out and Ken said, can't rob that one. I know that guy. So we go to a different store. Now, what we didn't know was this. They had called the police on us. Remember I told you that. Well, they called all the little gas stations and quick stops and everything around this area and warned them that we might come try to rob them with a ball bat. So at the first store, we just said we didn't want to rob the man who ended up dying. He had a pistol in his back pocket that was loaded, and he had a shotgun under the counter. He had planned to probably kill us, you know, or defend himself at the very least. So we go to the second store, and they knew what was going on. When we pulled up in the parking lot, we never got out of our car. They come and chased us away, trying to get us. They knew it was us, I guess. So that's when David says, if y'all don't do it this time, I'm taking you back to the party. So honestly, we had chickened out twice and I didn't I, did, I didn't really think we would do it. Um, so we we had had two ski masks when we started and I was supposed to take a shotgun and Kenneth was supposed to take take a 30 30 and we were going to go in there and throw down on him, you know, and I was going to he was going to grab beer and I was going to get the money, blah, blah. But we lost a ski mask. So we had to decide who's going to go in and distract them like we're going to buy something. And who's going to come in with a ski mask on and rob him? He's going to rob him, he says. And I'm telling him, if you're not going to do it, give me the gun and the ski mask. I'll do it. But I wish to God I would have had the gun, bro. Because if I would have had the gun, no one would have died. But that 14-year-old never shot a gun. He never handled one. But he wanted to do it. So when we pull up to the store this last time, I say, I'm going to go into the store. I'm going to go back to the back of the store where the, uh, where the coat the beer and everything's at. And while he's watching me, you just come in and rob him. Count one, two, three, four, five. We ain't thinking about the fact that he can identify me. There's not any cameras back then. There was no cameras in that store. We, but we're kids. We think we're going to do all this and then we're going to go back home and everything's going to be all right. But when we get to 12, I turn around and look and he, he's not coming. I'm thinking he chickened out. So I reach down to open the thing to get me a pop. And when I, and I hear, so I look back and he steps in the door, bro. And the guy behind the register was sitting on a, a stool like you are. And when he stepped in there and pulled that gun up, he went like this. When he went like this, Kenneth turned his head and pulled the trigger. First shot hit the man right above the left eye and killed him instantly. And I seen all that happen. And as soon as it happened, I went in the shop. Uh, you cannot describe the feeling of something like that happening. Uh, say it was life changing is an is an understatement. It was the greatest mistake of my life. And if there's anything I could do to change it and uh, give that man his life, then that's what I would do. Uh, can never forgive myself for the pain I caused that family. It, it's just if someone did that to me, kill my dad while he was working at a convenience store to get us by. I mean, uh, I have, since I've been outspoken with the family, I've spoken with his son. He's forgiven me. He supports my effort to try to save other kids from getting in trouble. He knows the things I've went through. And uh, I have some of his family on my Facebook friends list. Uh, they support my channel. They're subscribed to it. So uh, if they weren't okay with it, I wouldn't be doing it. But if there's anything I can do to save another kid and another family's victim's family, another mother like my mother, if there's anything I can do to stop that happening again, then by God, that's what I'm going to do. So um, how much money do you know uh, was taken during the robbery? $247. Nothing. Nothing. Man's life. $247. And uh, and uh, the 16 year old David didn't want any of the money once he knew someone had died for it. And when me and Kenneth went to split the money, I said, I, I don't want the money either. And then Kenneth didn't want the money either. And I know I said on Chad Mark's channel, we, we were sending the money back and people said, who sends the money back? Like they didn't believe that. Well, we did. We we did that because we, we weren't trying to kill nobody, man. We were just kids trying to run away from home. We're trying to kill nobody, man. When that happened, that changed everything. 
David threw up all night, turned himself in first thing in the morning. I turned myself in. Kenneth wasn't far behind us. When we got to the police station, we were told on ourselves and didn't even realize that. We were just trying to tell the truth. We didn't mean to do that. We, we were running away from home. We didn't mean to kill no one. And uh, in the end, that's what saved us from getting life sentences. Uh, they went to the, the wife of the man who was killed, the DA did, and asked, do you want me to get them life sentences? And she said, they were kids. I don't think they meant to kill him. I want them to go to prison, but I, don't, I want them to have a, at least another chance. But if they get out and mess up, I want them to have to go back for a long time. And that's why we both ended up with street time, because she requested that, that we would get a chance. But if we messed up, we would have to go back and do that time. And uh, so, yeah. When you say street time, what do you mean by that? I had a 12-year suspended sentence. So for the first four years I was out, I had to uh, go and... Every every uh, month, I would have to go and do a UA. I had to have a job. I had to have a place where I lived, a permanent residence. I had to have a phone number that they could call me at any time. If my PO wanted to call me at 2 o'clock in the morning and come out and do a UA, I had to answer that phone and be at that house and provide it. And it was supposed to be four years of that and then eight more where I would just be like anyone else. But if I committed a crime, I would have to do the rest of that sentence plus whatever else I ended up with. So, but uh, for two years, I walked the line and, and I passed all my UAs and I kept a job and I, I did everything that was asked of me. And so they ended up cutting me loose off of that in two years, but it was 34 years from March 4th, 1989 before I was off of it um, had to do it all. So after you were arrested and charged, how were you housed while you were on trial being that you were a juvenile? So when they first locked me up, they sent me to what's called the Berry house in Oklahoma city. Uh, it's a juvenile detention center uh, here in Oklahoma, uh, in the Oklahoma city area. If you steal a car, if you shoot someone, if you do a drive by, you kill somebody, it break into someone's house, and you're 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, now on down, they're going to take you and put you in a bury house. Now, if you are 16 years old and you kill someone, you'll go to the county jail, and then you have to be reversed to a juvenile. But even if you're certified as an adult, when they send you to the county, which is what happened to me, they certified me as an adult after five months, and uh, they sent me to the county jail. And when I got to the county jail, I was there a year and five months because I was so small. I was five, six and 130 pounds. I was so small. My lawyers were trying to put off everything they could, ask for extensions on everything because they knew I was going to end up in prison. And they were trying to let me get a little bigger before I went because I, I was 15 and looked 12. Uh, so they knew I was going to have a hard time of it. P people didn't expect me to make it in prison. Uh yeah, they didn't expect me to make it. After you were convicted and sentenced to prison, how did you react emotionally? Oh, brother, that, I, I can't even. I wish there was a, a way. I, I'm writing a book. I wish there was a way. I, I haven't figured out yet how to really make people understand what it felt like for me. Like I told you earlier, I'd only been to church camp and church every Wednesday and Sunday and never been away from home, really. Maybe a night. Um. So they take me and they put me in the very house. And when they took me there, the first day, they take me in there and they put me in this little cell all by myself. And I'm looking outside the window. I'm not racist in any way, okay? But you asked me how it felt. I grew up in a little bitty country town that's all white except for one black family. Well, two black families. One black family was my basketball coach. Real good guy, man. I, I really looked up to him. But he was the only black guy I knew. And there was one black kid in my school. And that's the only black people I knew. I wasn't racist. My grandmother was real Christian. If you, you better not, you don't use those foul slang words around my grandmother. She'll whoop you with a switch. So I wasn't raised racist. I didn't know no reason to be racist. I'm, my grandmother raised me. We're all children of God. Okay. The black, the brown, the red, all, you know, we, you sing the little song at church that we're all one child of God in my church. So when I went to prison, I, I didn't have no reason to be racist. 
But going to prison sometimes will make you racist. I'm not, but it can happen. It can make you that way. Uh, but when I got to the Berry House, they put me in that cell, and I'm looking out this little square window about this big, and everyone, like the staff, are all black people. There's a, there's two or three other cells I can see where other kids are looking out, and they're all black people, and they're all older than me. And everyone I see is older than me, and they're all black. So I really didn't know what what to think, man. So in the Berry House, they have three day rooms, A, B, and C. Well, Kenneth was in B day room and he was the only white kid in there. There was no white kids in C and I was the only white kid in A and they have single cells. So I was in my own cell. Uh, but you come out into the day room with all the other kids and there's like 40 kids in there and all they're all black. There's no white kids. And so we just killed someone. I'm in shock. I've never been away from home and now I've been. I'm arrested. I'm in, I'm locked up and I'm with all these black people. I've never been around any black people. There's no other white people around to tell me what's going on or to talk to not even any staff. And so I was terrified, man. I was freaking terrified. I didn't use uh, in the mornings you come out of your cell and you go eat breakfast and I would go eat breakfast and then I'll go right back and lock in my cell. I was I was scared. Um, other kids would stay out in the day room, watch TV, play dominoes and chess at the little tables, checkers, stuff like that. Uh, you go to school during the day. You can get a level if you go to school where you can get to stay out an extra hour at night and get a little treat, which is an incentive to do good. Also, while you're in the Berry House, you're waiting to see if you're going to be certified as an adult. And they're they are watching everything you do. At the end of every shift, they're writing down your behavior. They use this information to decide whether or not to certify you as an adult. So if you're in for murder and you get in fights a lot with the other kids, it shows that you're violent. So I didn't, my lawyers told me, don't be getting in no fights. Don't ever say you're going to kill nobody. Don't ever threaten any kind of harm to anyone because they're going to use it against you when they try to certify you as an adult and when you go to court. So I find myself from being the all-American kid going to school every day to being locked in this place where there's no one else who looks like me. I'm the youngest one there other than my fault partner, but he's in the other day room. I never see him. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I was just lost and in shock. I was there three days before I finally started coming out of my cell. And uh, the, the black guys picked on me and they jumped me three and four on one and beat me up. Uh, and it happened every day. I got stabbed uh, with a pencil. I still have a scar on it for my stomach in the Berry House. Uh, just to be completely honest, the Berry House might have been as rough as anywhere I've ever been. <laughs> and uh, that's saying something because kids don't care, man. And they're heartless. And they're trying to prove they're tough to their friends. And uh, they, they will hurt you, man, without feeling bad about it. So the Berry House was pretty rough. So after the Berry House, um, you went to prison, obviously. Was it tough to adjust, being that you were so young? Man, it was a nightmare, man. And uh, there's really no other word that can describe that. When I, when they first took me, okay, so after I told you, I was, okay, so I turned 15 in November. And March 4th, I was locked up. For five months, I was in the Berry House. And then a year and five months, I was in the county. I, like I told you, they kept trying to put things off, trying to let me grow up a little. So by the time I made it to a and I turned 17 on November 15th. And then in December 26th, a month and 11 days later, I was in prison. The day they took me out on that yard, dude, I, I had been locked in the Berry House, you know, in this little day room. And then I was in the county jail in one day room. So when they walked me out on a prison yard, it was, it seemed huge to me because I was just a kid and I had been locked in such a little area for almost two years now. And I remember telling that guard when he was walking me across there with my mat that I said, man, this place is big. And he said, it's going to get small soon enough. And he wasn't lying about that. But they walked me when they walked me over to my unit, bro. When they walked me to my unit, I, the guards were telling each other to keep an eye on me because I wasn't going to make it. 
and they took me up and put me in a cell by myself. And there, there are uh, at Lexington. There's a like a little police shack. It's surrounded by plexiglass, so they can look out and watch these two day rooms. All right, so you have two day rooms on the unit, and then there's an office there where they can watch. And then they're right next to the office on the wall of the office. There are two phone booths where you can stand and make a phone call, collect call. And uh, so I put my stuff up, lock my door, I immediately go to the phone. And the phone is right by the police. And I'm not standing there so the police can watch me, but it certainly was making me feel a little better that they could see me. Because I look over. Now, at this time, I just turned 17, but I look 14 or 15 at most. And there was no one at this time going to prison that young in Oklahoma. Like, that happens now, but that did not happen back then. Uh, me and Kenneth were the first ones in Oklahoma to go that young. Uh, we were the first, no doubt about it. Check the dates. We were the ones. And uh, so I look over in the day room, dude, and, and all these black guys are ganging up. And they're all looking at me, and they're asking me stuff like, hey, do I know you? Don't I know you from somewhere? And I said, no, you don't know me. Was your brother in prison? Because I've sure seen somebody that looks like you. Just try and talk to me. Because people don't just walk right up on you and gaffle you because they don't know who you might be friends with or might what you might be capable of. But if they can carry on a conversation with you, they can get a feel, of, feel for you. Will you fight? What kind of character? Are you calm? Are you nervous? Are you scared? You can pick all that up on someone if you can just stand and have a conversation with them. And uh, that's what they were doing, man. And uh, that first year I was in, I had so many people that would uh, try to look at my ass or make remarks to me. Like if someone calls you a punk, that means you're another man's girl. You are, uh, you submit to another man. You give him head, let him screw you, whatever it may be that he wants to do. Take your canteen, make you clean his cell. All these things, have you washing his laundry with a bar of soap? All these things can really happen in prison. I remember before I got in trouble, one day I was sitting there and we were watching TV, me and my mom. And there was a kid that was 18 or 19 on TV and he was going to court. He had tried to rob a store. And I, was, I said, I don't know how he got caught. Uh, I said, uh, that seems like it would be easy. And my mom said, don't you even think about that. Do you know what they do to people like you in prison? But of course, I didn't know and I couldn't imagine it. And it just rolled off of me because there was no YouTube back then. I couldn't go and watch a channel like yours or mine to see exactly what does happen when you do that shit. Because if I could have, maybe I wouldn't have done it. And, and that's why I feel like what we do is so important. Because as a young man, a lot of times you want to be that guy that says, hey, I've been to prison. Yeah, I killed someone. I've done this. I'm tough. I've done that. But when you see someone who suffered the consequences of living that life, then you see it's a lot better to be a doctor, bro, than to be me. You, you feel me? I, I'm a living mistake. But I still can be happy, and I hope that anyone who does make a mistake can still fight their way through that and find happiness. Uh, because it's really all up here in your head, I believe. Uh, you can be unhappy or happy anywhere. And yeah. So did you ever run into any problems like that? Any any like uh, sexual assaults or being jumped or anything while you were oh, in yes, prison? Oh, yeah, bro. Oh, yeah. I uh, I fought naked in the shower in McAllister when I was 19 because a guy tried to touch me while I was taking a shower. I've had a guy try to rape me uh, on the first yard I was at at Lexington. I had a black guy that I played basketball all the time with. His name was Big Youngster. And I uh, played basketball with him all the time, dude. He was a black guy. He was a lot bigger than me. Uh, I thought we were friends. Like we would get high together all the time. He was the one that started getting me to get high on weed. I had never smoked weed and he talked me into doing it. So I would buy it, of course. Say, hey man, I'll show you this. We'll smoke this. I'll help you pay for it. We got to get it on your word. He don't trust me. And then I get it on my word. And then when it comes time to pay it for some reason or another, they can't help. So I have to pay it all. And so they were just uh, getting me to do drugs so they could get high. They were using me. So everybody's trying to tell me that this guy's gay, man. That guy's gay. He uh, He's going to try to have sex with you. But he was so nice to me, dude. I just didn't see it. Like, he didn't come off to me like that. I thought me and him were friends. We play basketball together. We get high together. And people have been warning me. But 
one day I come back from visit. And what we do when we get ready to get high is you go in the cell and you'll put the curtain up in the window. You have a little piece of cardboard that you stick up in the window to block the police looking in. And people put that in the window and lock the door so they can sit and use the bathroom in private without their cell partner. He will step out of the cell, lock the door, put the curtain up. You can even just throw a towel over the door. Okay. So we would go in there, throw a towel over the door, sit there and roll a joint and get high. I don't realize he's going and telling people that when we put that curtain up, he's in there doing stuff with me. He's trying to make me look bad, but I don't even know this is going on. Have no idea people are thinking this about me. Um, so one day I come back from visit. I go in, I sit down on the cell, and I grab a magazine and put it in my lap for him to give me the weed so I can roll us a joint. I got the papers out. Hey, he, he locks the door and puts the curtain over the door. And he turns around and says, you know what time it is? And I said, hell yeah, man, time to get high. I'm waiting on him to throw me the joint, the cap, so I can roll it. And for what for people that don't know, a cap. In prison, the way weed is measured in Oklahoma is you take a chapstick cap and you fill it up with weed, ground up weed, and that's a cap. And that's how it's sold. And so I was waiting on him to give me a cap to roll. And he says, uh, you know what time it is? I said, yeah, time to get high. He said, no, people been telling you. So now I set the magazine beside me and, he, and his demeanor's changed. And I'm thinking, oh, well, what's going on? But I'm thinking this is my friend and, you know, I'm confused and he hits me in the mouth. Well, he should have kept hitting me. Probably could have got me the best of me. But he hit me and stopped. He hit me and then looked at me and said, now pull your pants down. But when he said that, I, I, I charged him. I grabbed him around the waist. I got him on the ground. We fought for close to 15 minutes. I didn't whoop him. I was too small to knock anybody out. But I could wrestle real good and I didn't smoke. And he did smoke and he was bigger and heavier than me. And he and he couldn't make me quit. Couldn't get a good lick on me because I was keeping my head in close. So if you keep your head in close to someone, even if they hit you, they can't hit you hard enough to knock you out. So if he couldn't choke me out or make me give up, it's all a matter of who's got the longest wind and the biggest heart. And I'm not giving up. And I could run all day. So at the end of that 15 minutes, he was tired. He was out of breath. Tell me he respected me now. We're going to be friends but we could never be friends again in this life. If that had happened to me later on in my sentence, after I became a hardened criminal, which I did at one point in my life, become a very hardened convict, everything you can imagine that a white guy could do in prison to be a good white boy or a hard white boy, I've done that. I've stabbed people and I've bit people in the head with locks and I've been beaten in the head with locks and I've been stabbed and I've, I don't know how many fights I've been in. But in the beginning, I was terrified. Had he done that later in my sentence, I would have tried to stab him to death for it. But at the time, I was just a kid, man. I was afraid. I was scared. I didn't have any friends. And really, you don't know what to do when something like that happens to you. It's easy to look back on it later in your life and think I should have done this or I should have done that. But it's not that easy at the moment. You know. So how did you spend your time in prison? So for the most part, doing everything wrong. Uh, like I told you, the older guys would come and get me to go get stuff to get high on, you know, so we could all get high, but then I would end up paying for it. So the next thing that happened, these guys would come to me. And uh, when I was younger, I was a pretty good looking kid, man. And these guys would come to me and tell me, let us use your picture to send to this girl. We're going to write these letters, pretend like we're you. We're going to use your picture. We're going to get her to come bring you drugs or send you money. Let us use your picture. So they started off doing that and then they have a girl come see me and next thing you know i'm helping get in these drugs and once you get the drugs in oh wow everyone wants to be my friend now i don't have to look for a friend now bro now i'm not nervous anymore now everybody's friends with me everybody's my buddy now so once i got a, a, a once i felt what that felt like when you have the drugs in prison you're basically like donald trump out here money is no object for you it's easy, okay, when you're out here and you don't have nothing and you see all these people with a lot of shit, that's one thing. But when you don't, none of you have shit, that's a whole different thing. You don't feel like you're doing so bad when no one around you has anything either, and that's what's going on in prison. So when you're in here and ain't nobody got shit, 
and you're having a hard time even getting a candy bar from the canteen. And now all of a sudden you can have anything in the canteen. And on top of that, everyone wants to be your friend. It gives you power. People want to hold your old nutsack, man. If you got the dope sack, everybody wants to be your friend. Now you can build you an army. All you got to do is get them high here and there. And once I got a piece of that, every yard I went to, man, I was finding a way to sneak drugs in every one of them. Uh, I, I have a chat. We talked about it. Uh, not trying to plug it now, but in my thing, that's what I do is I go from prison to prison explaining what happened at each one. And uh, even though I had that, I had to do a 22 year sentence in before I could get out and do a 12 suspended. I could have done that 22 in seven or eight years with good time. But I kept getting in trouble, man. And when you deal drugs, you don't just get caught with in trouble for the drugs. You also get dirty UAs. And every you every time you get a dirty UA, you lose between a half a year and a year of your good time if you have any built up. So I could go to school or go to a job and do my job for a year and build some good time up. But then one dirty UA and you lose it all. Uh, or maybe one time I get caught writing a letter trying to get someone to bring drugs in or get caught talking on a phone about it. Or maybe, God forbid, get caught with drugs and get more time. Uh, thank thank the Lord I never got caught with drugs and got more time for it because that happens and people never get out of prison because they end up getting more time than they can do. Uh, so I messed up everywhere I went, man, and that's why I had to do pretty much all my sentence. And another thing that happens when you deal drugs is you end up in confrontations with other inmates. Uh, people owe you money and sometimes can't pay and they'll go to the police and say they owe you and they'll file what's called a separatise on you. And they'll lock you up and you can never be on the same yard with that guy again. And if he's on a good yard, you can never go there now. But if this happens with you with a few people, there's only eight or nine places to go. So if you have too many people go up there and say they owe you money, it ends up where you can't go anywhere. Like you end up in McAllister Maximum Security or something just because there's nowhere to send you. Um, and you can end up getting killed yourself or robbed by other inmates over drugs so going to prison and doing drugs or especially selling drugs is the absolutely worst thing you can do and i did it the whole time i was in there people said i did my 22 years like a life sentence and the truth is i did but it wasn't intentional um in the beginning i was just so scared as a kid going in there you learn to project strength to avoid conflict uh you you show strength so that people won't challenge you. So if you get into someone, you try to act as crazy as you can to deter the next guy from doing it. But the problem is you keep pretending like you're someone, like, you, like you're this tough guy. You keep wearing that mask, and what happens is you become that. Next thing you know, you really are mean all the time. You really do feel that way. And uh, sometimes it's hard to take that mask off. And uh, I, I didn't think I would ever get out of prison. And so I kept pretending that I was a killer. I'm a killer. I'm a killer until I really felt like I was a killer. And uh, and that's why I ended up, you know, I would get my knife. If you challenged me, I would go and get my knife and put magazines on and wrap a towel around my neck and come try to stab you. You know, if you put me in that position and when you walk around portraying that because you're dealing drugs. If you portray that and someone calls you on it, you got to do it. And so it's very easy to get in prison and not get out of it, man. If you're if you have a lot of pride and you're worried about what everyone else thought. And, and so I end up spending 20 years of my life trying to be somebody in prison. And it didn't mean a damn thing, but you're still away 20 years of my life. Um it started off with one mistake as a kid and it became another mistake, another mistake and another mistake. And I really didn't straighten up until I got out of prison and met my wife. Uh, my wife was a guard at the last prison I was at. Uh, I got her fired. I discharged from the hole from a solitary over it. Spent the last two weeks in solitary confinement because of it. Um, but I got out and I got with her and I have never been with another woman and I've, I haven't gotten in trouble for anything. And this is my 14th year of being free. So her and my mom, dude, my mom has stuck by me through everything. Uh, she was there through, for me through thick and thin, through it all. 
and uh, I could never do that to her again. Uh, I'm so sorry for what I've done to everybody involved that I could just never do it again, man. Uh, I would rather die myself than to do that again. And rather remember me that way, dude, than to remember me doing something like that again. It, it was absolutely the worst mistake you can make. So. so while you were incarcerated, how did prison politics work where you were? You know, I have a lot of people ask me that, but in Oklahoma, there just really aren't prison politics. Hmm. Uh, we're, we're, really, we're really a little country place. Uh, you've got Crips and Bloods. Uh, you more Crips than Bloods, predominantly Crips in Oklahoma, but there are some Bloods too. Uh, you've got a couple Mexican groups, but like you have the Serenos, which they're everywhere, but there aren't a lot of Serenos. But uh, then you have Southside Locos from Oklahoma City, and that's mainly the most that you will see is those, and that's because they're from around that area. Uh, there's a there's always a group of uh, Native Americans, and they have an Indian Brotherhood. And uh, the only, uh, the big brotherhood in Oklahoma is the UAB, the Universal Aryan Brotherhood in Oklahoma. And uh, it, it really is big. It is big. And, uh, but as far as politics, that just, like I hear guys in other states say, who's got the keys to the car, you know, on the, that doesn't exist in Oklahoma. No one has the keys to anything. You just kind of do your own thing, man. You're your own man unless you join up for something. If you join a gang, then you're going to have to represent that gang. But as long as you're your own man, you're your own man. I guess we're just too country for it because uh, that stuff amazes me when I hear these other guys talk about all that. Like in, in a video, uh, this guy Splinter made, he was talking about a guy on the unit came, made all these guys, uh, white guys were militant, made them make their beds. In Oklahoma, nothing like that's going to happen. If you're on an open day room or, or for some reason, the guards may make you make your bed, but no inmate's ever going to tell you to make your bed. That that just no one has the keys to anything. Uh, there's never one guy that runs a day room. Never. There's never one guy that runs a yard. Even in the Brotherhood, there's never one guy. There's always a group of guys that make a decision. And then this other guy may call how it goes down. But it's always decided by a group of men. It's never decided by one man. No man is that hard to control a prison or a yard or even a day room in this state. You may end up in charge of it because a group of people put you there, but you don't just go in and take the keys and, you know, it doesn't work that way in Oklahoma. So do you remember the feeling when you were finally released into the free world? Oh my gosh, dude. No feeling in your life and my life ever again will compare to that. It amazes me that now, this is, you know, something I always preach on my channel, brothers, as I tell people that if you don't like what's going on in your head, if you're stressing, if you don't like what's change the channel, if it, to pick up your blessings each and every day, you have a choice in the morning when you get up, whether you want to pick up your curses, think about all the things that are bad in your life and going on now, or whether you want to pick up your blessings, all the things that are good in your life at all. I didn't have a car. I had 170, uh, I had, a, I think I had $176 saved up over 20 years. So I had $170 to my name. The clothes I had on my back were my brothers given to me to wear home. I didn't have nothing, bro. Nothing, no home, no car, no driver's license. I was 35 years old and had never driven a car and I'd never been with a woman. And I was happier than I had ever been in my life. And no happiness can compare to it. And I didn't have a thing just because I was free. They have broken me down that far that just being free, being able to hug my wife or my mom, just that freedom, being able to take a shower when I want, being able to go out and sit on the front porch and, and just look at the evening sky, things that people take for granted each and every day. You never think about the starter on your car until it doesn't work and that's how it is when you go to prison and uh the day i got out I, nothing will ever compare to that for me but the thing is sitting right here today i own the house i'm in today i own my vehicle now i've been married for 14 years and i have a steady income so that i'm okay but i'm not as happy today as i was that day when i had nothing so why is that 
It's because we take for granted the things that we have in our life every day. And we don't take advantage of the things that we have. We don't appreciate them the way we should until they're not there anymore. Uh, I preach it all the time, man. Don't ever let anyone make you make it worse for you. If you think you're doing bad, look around because there's someone doing worse. So how are you spending your time these days in the free world? So I'm disabled right now. I hurt my back. Uh, I suffer from night terrors, bipolar, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm disabled from all that. Uh, but I'm working on writing a book. And I have a YouTube channel uh, where I make videos about what's happened to me in my life and try to be a positive influence to young people. So if you could say anything to someone, let's say a juvenile that's going down the same path as you, what might that be? What I would say is, man, uh, that it all seems like everything needs to happen right now, right now, right now. It's hard to see those few years ahead. But 18 is coming and it's coming soon. And once you get to 18, man, it's all on you from there, brother. Every bit of it. So try to take advantage of these few years you have to prepare for that while you're not the one paying the bills. Well, and and I don't worry about your friends man i do not hang out or talk to one person i knew when i was 15 years old and i was so worried about what my friends thought that it, i let it put me in a position that led me to be in prison 20 years i was so worried about what they thought of me my girlfriend and man i do not know any of those people now when you're young you feel that things are so serious but the truth is right now you're just learning and getting ready for the serious things in life so take advantage of each and every day because no tomorrow is promised to you. Be thankful for everything you have. Listen to your parents because if they've given you something, if you've got a PlayStation, if you're watching this on a TV in your room, it's because they gave it to you instead of getting something for themselves. If you're eating, it's because they've sacrificed something for themselves to give it to you. So take advantage of it while you can. And, uh, the future can be very good or it can be very bad. And it's much better to be a doctor, a banker, a lawyer, a guy that's been in prison. I can guarantee you that. So is there anything that you'd like the public to know about yourself or this case? Uh, no, nothing else. I pretty much cover it all on my YouTube channel. Uh, that, that's the only thing I would say. If you'd like to check out my YouTube channel, you can just uh, go on YouTube and search my name, Ricky Dye, R-I-C-K-E-Y-D-Y-E. Uh, you can also Google it and see that everything I tell you is true. Uh, it was all of the newspapers. In the newspaper, it said uh, one article does say that we we talked about killing the guy. That's absolutely not true. But the rest of it's pretty spot on. And uh, in my videos, I didn't really know where to start at the beginning. I was really nervous. So I just started at the beginning with what happened. And uh, then I just kind of took it as it went. And it's grown as it as it's gone. I have a few thousand subscribers now. So. If anyone's willing to uh, check that out, I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you, bro, for uh, having me on. Yeah, for sure. And and thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time. And I'm glad that I came across your story and we're, we were able to do this. Well, you've, I think you've done a great job on the interview, man. You've had, you've had uh, great questions, have been very engaging. And um, I really appreciate it, man, to give me a chance to put it out there. And I hope that it helps us both and, and maybe help some kid along the way. Awesome, for sure. Thank you. That was my interview with Ricky Dye. For extra content, ad-free episodes, and more, head on over to patreon.com slash unforbidden truth. Thank you for listening. See you on the next one. Unforbidden truth.